Well, welcome everybody. I'm Pastor Wayne with Prosperity in Christ Church in beautiful San Antonio, Texas. Amen. Hallelujah. Today we're going to talk about the secret to financial increase. Now, it's amazing how many views I get on YouTube. When I put financial in there, it just it seems to explode. I guess because everybody's suffering the same fate, trying to make it, right? You got a family to feed, you got things to do. It's understandable. But financial prosperity is godly, it is God's plan for us. We are to lack nothing, there's no lack. Today I need to teach you the biblical roadmap to increase in every area of your life, and not just financially, but in your health and every area. I need to show you biblically how to live a life of prosperity in every area of your life. And it is possible to have a life of prosperity in every area of your life. From the very beginning of creation, God always formulated a way for us to have no lack of any kind. He's always made a way for that. Unfortunately, we, for the most part, have lived a life of fear and lack that's against God's will. We have had our biblical and godly prosperity stolen from us because of our first lack. And what is our first lack? The lack of knowledge of God's word. If you know God's word, you will not have lack of any kind. Because if you really know God's word, you'll understand he's the God of no lack of any kind. We have lived a life from one crisis to the next, and I'm correct. It almost seems as though we live a life of Russian roulette. We too many times have been at the end of our ropes and barely hanging on. This doesn't just happen to the non-believer in Christ. This is happening in churches and homes all around this world. People go to church every Sunday and they go home to the power off. You know, we're what's happening all over the world, but God, it does not have to be this way. There is a way to come through this and come out of this. Sickness and poverty has become a religion in itself in our churches and in our homes. We worship our illnesses and poverty by speaking them out more than we do God's word. Some have been down so long that they expect only despair in their lives because that's what they speak and hear every day in their own home. They teach it to their children like there is no, there is no hope, generation after generation. They complain about bills of sickness like it's a religion that must be reminded to everyone over and over. We have accepted things that go against the Word of God because we really don't know the Word of God. We live a double standard. We believe in God, but we don't believe God for the increase that He promises us. We don't believe God for the divine health that He promises us. We worship and trust our poverty and sickness more than we worship and trust our mighty God. So do we really believe in God after all this? In my own life, I've suffered my own confusion and continual sense of defeat and failure. I would pray and nothing would happen. I knew the Bible was true, so I searched diligently to find where I was missing it at. One day I was reading out of the book of Hebrews in the Word and I saw it. Hebrews 4:14, 4, seeing that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, yes. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Note, some, ver some versions say confession. Christianity itself is called the great confession. When I what I saw here is what I was confessing. And what... I was confessing had been holding, what have I been holding fast to? I was confessing my problems more than I was confessing the mighty power of my God. I realized that I was to hold fast to the absolute integrity of God's word. The absolute integrity of the Bible. 
word for word. There's not opinions. The Bible isn't, isn't negotiable. It is the word of God. It has one meaning and one meaning only. I am to hold fast to the confession of Jesus Christ, not the confession of my own problems. I am to hold fast of the redemptive nature of the born again man in Christ. Born to get into what? Born to get into the blessing. Amen. That's what you're born to get into. You came from the curse. Now you're in the blessing. Live in the blessing and kick the curse out of your life. Quit acting like that curse is some, some mighty God with power over you because it has nothing other than what you give it. The very nature of God and that God is my strength and my source. I had to get a new confession. And this means that Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 is absolute fact and truth. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. Amen. So my confession is that I am to hold fast to the confession that surely he hath borne my sicknesses and carried my diseases and that by his stripes I am healed. So why am I confessing something else? Why am I running around confessing my pains and my this problem and that problem when he says I was healed? Not I will be healed. I am healed. The word said we were healed and not going to be healed. The problem is that it was very hard for me to hold to this confession with absolute integrity. When I myself was suffering pain in my own body and my own financial lack. How could I confess perfect healing when I myself had something else? How could I confess financial strength when I confessed poverty? What I realized then was that I had two confessions in my life. I had been confessing the absolute truth of the Word of God, and at the same time, I was making a confession to myself that I was not healed, that I was not financially stable. I was confessing my pain instead of confessing my healing. The Word says bitter water and sweet water can't come out of the same spring because one ruins the other. I would confess that by His stripes I was healed, then a few hours later, I'd confess the pain and sickness to still be in me. What was happening was that the second confession destroyed the first confession. You know, when I stopped confessing my pain that I had in my body, I quit having pain shortly after that. Amen. And when it spurs up, I just confess God is my source. I don't stand on the pain. I stand on the word of God. Amen. And the pain goes. I realized that I had two confessions. I had the confession of the redemptive healing of Christ was fact. Then my second confession was that the redemptive healing of Christ was not fact. It was against my first confession. I was serving two masters. One was faith and the other one was doubt and fear. I was doing what Jesus said we can't do in Matthew 6 and 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. So I had to learn how to become the master of my own confession. God couldn't make me the master of my confession. I had to make me the master of my confession. I quit praying to God for something to do that I had to do. It was up to me to change my confession. God already confessed what he was going to confess. It was up to me to receive it. So I had to learn how to become the master of my own confession. I had to learn how to only have one confession. And that confession had to be what the word of God says I have. And who the word of God says that I am. Example, if I confess with my mouth, Philippians 4.19, that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I can take that your out, put mine, but, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Then I need to quit confessing that I can't pay my bills, right? 
Why am I confessing that when he says he's going to take care of it? Because that would be a dual confession. It would remove the blessing of the first confession. That God will supply all my needs according to his riches in, in Christ Jesus. And he's very rich. And where he's at, the streets are paved to gold. They're, they got diamonds hanging from their street lights. You understand, they ain't like us with lights going out. They never go out. They got the glory of God keeping their, their, their heaven lit. And this does mean that he will supply my needs to pay my bills. And he will supply your needs to pay your bills. Let me tell you this. Faith holds fast to the confession of the word. But common sense knowledge holds fast to the evidence of sight. And that's the problem. We live in the world of sight instead of the world of, of confession of Jesus. And to confess the word, we must live by faith and not by sight. As said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we live by faith, not by sight. Why don't we live by sight? Because sight's designed for fear. What you see, you fear. Worldly knowledge holds fast the confession of physical evidence. Example, a bill coming up with no evidence of having the money to pay it. That's worldly knowledge. That's living by sight. I don't see the money. I can't pay it. So all of a sudden, the fear spirit comes in, takes over, and starts wrecking your life. You can't sleep. You're irritable. You're not getting along with your wife anymore. Your kids, you're snappy. Why? Because you let the devil in. You, you, you took God out and brought him in. But faith knowledge says, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Yes. All my needs. Faith knowledge is the word of God we know and speak. If we accept physical knowledge against God's word, we nullify the word. One is based on faith and one is based on fear. And as we learned in previous teaching, fear is an evil spirit that is not of God. Fear is the fear spirit of hell. Do you understand that? The fear spirit comes straight from hell. So why am I confessing its power in my life? Let it stay in hell where it belongs. I don't need it with me. In the garden, when Adam and his wife sinned, the first thing that came on them was the fear spirit. They were in fear and they got possessed by the fear spirit. And they were hiding from God, weren't they? Before then, there was no fear, fear in them. Why? Because God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. So God never gave them the spirit of fear either. That one came from Satan and straight from hell. God gave us only the spirit of power and love. And it says so in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Amen? What does self-control mean? It means I can control my confession. I can control it. Just because I see it don't mean i got to stand on fear and I stand on God. Amen. That's what, what we're doing. So you can control your fear by your confession and your faith in God. Most believers fail when things become difficult. Why? Because they lose their confession. They don't see it. If they can't see it, it don't look good. It's not there. So do they really have faith? No, because they lose their confession. They say, God has turned his back on me because this horrible thing has come against me. But when the sun is shining, their confession is powerful and faithful. But when a storm comes, the, the, the testings of their faith come and they fall apart. Remember on the boat, Jesus' own disciples are with him. They'd not seen him do all kinds of miracles. They, they should have known by then who he was. And they were still in fear, weren't they? They were scared to death. The storm was on. Oh, Lord, Master, please wake up. We're all going to perish. We're going to die. And Jesus wasn't none too pleased with them either. He just got up and raised some of his arms and calm. The storm was calmed. And that's our storms in life. We need to remember who calms the storms and who creates them. Jesus didn't bring a storm against that boat today. That was Satan trying to destroy them disciples. He didn't want them walking the earth. He figured if he could drown them, he could get rid of them, right? But he come against the master, and the master gets rid of him every time. Amen. So the testings of our faith come. They fall apart. And then the adversary, the devil, takes advantage of them and fulfills their new testimony of fear and doubt. 
because they gave up their faith confession for their new confession of defeat. Every time we confess defeat, sickness, poverty, lack, and failure, we magnify the devil and weaken our faith in God. We destroy our blessing and confidence in God's word. We get what we say. We always get what we say. We get it every time, always. If you don't want it, don't speak it. If you do want it, speak it. We must hold fast to our confession of faith no matter what comes against us. We need to know the word better than we know our problems. We must confess only what the word of God says and only do what the word of God says we can do. Now there is another way that we fail to receive the fullness of godly prosperity. And this is in our tithes. From the beginning of man, God has always made a way for us to perfect ourselves in, in him, at least in one area. That way is in our tithes and offerings. If you are a marginal tither, you will have a marginal life. Through tithing, you control how successful you want to be. Just how important is tithing to God? Let's find out. The first thing that we need to understand is that everything on this earth already belongs to God. You're not giving him something of yours. You're giving him back something of his. Right. Psalm 24, 1, 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So everything we see, everything we have, it all belongs to God. If we have it, it's only by his grace. No matter what anyone thinks, it's only by his grace that anyone has any property, wealth, health, and prosperity. That is it. That is it. And since the beginning of man, God has always had a way for us to be blessed in it. Yes. It's through our tithes back to him. Amen. He has always required us to return him 10% of our prosperity that he gave us back to him. Why? First off, it's his already. And if, you, and if you don't, you're stealing from him. But why does he want us to give something to him? Let's find out. Everybody always asks, why does God need it? Why does God need my money? God owns everything. I hear that so many times. I can, it's a rehearsal. It's like it's their new religion. They don't have to give nothing to God because they know all these. They, have, they can question God. Well, here's why. I'm going to give you the answer right out of the Bible. It's very clear, and you will understand without a doubt why. Now, Deuteronomy 14, 22-23, make an offering of 10% a tithe of all the produce which grows in your fields year after year. Bring this into the presence of God, your God, at the place he designates for worship, and there eat the tithe from your grain, wine, and oil, and the first fruits from your herds and flocks. In this way, you will learn to live in deep reverence before your God, your God, as long as you live. That's why, so you'll learn to live in deep reverence for your God as long as you live. We see here why God requires us to tithe. The Word of God says that we will learn to live in deep reverence to Him as long as we live. So He does this so that we will stay close to Him. Yes. That's why. To keep us part of him to make his life part of our lives this is the reason and this alone should be enough reason for us we should need no other reason when we tithe we open the miracle and the blessing into our lives and miracles still come i see miracles all the time malachi 3 7 through 10 return to me so i can return to you says the god of heaven's armies you ask, but how do we return? They want to know. How do we return to you, Father God? Father God, how can we return to you? Begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God, but you rob me day after day? You ask, how have we robbed you? The tithe and offering, that's how. And now you are under the curse, the whole lot of you, because you are robbing me. Bring your full tithe into the temple treasury so that there will be an ample provision in my temple. Test me in this and see if I don't open up the heaven itself to do you and pour out a blessing beyond your wildest dreams. Beyond your wildest dreams. For my part, I will defend you against marauders, 
protect your wheat fields and vegetable gardens against blunders. The message of God, of the angel of heaven's army, say so. The message I'm teaching you today is the power and the miracle of the time. And there is a miracle of the time. It's the power of God we receive from this. And we do receive power from God from this. God sees our tithe as a holy tithe. When you tithe, you come on the holy ground. God said himself, return to me so I can return to you. Without the tithe, you are living hand to mouth. I should say living by your own hand to your own mouth, not God's hand. But God is telling it that there's a better way. He says he will bless those hands and prosper you in ways that are beyond your wildest dreams. Be right out of the word of God. Beyond your wildest dreams. What is he talking about? Financial success. That's what he's talking about. Yes. What would be on your wild, your wildest financial dreams? Another thing that God promises that when we tithe, we bless the very nation that we live in. It says in Malachi 3.12, you'll be voted happiest nation. You'll experience what it's like to be a country of grace. God of angels army says so. There is no limits of the blessing that returns to us because of our tithes. I'm not teaching you this to bless me. I'm already blessed. Yes. I'm teaching this to bless you. Yes, yes. If you want to be truly blessed in all financial areas of your life, if you want to come out of poverty, if you want to come out of despair, and you want to come into the blessing and the health and the joy and the prosperity of the King of Kings, then get your tithing right with God, and He will honor you. You worship Him with your tithe. Amen. If you want this nation to be great, the great God-fearing light to the world it once was, instead of this nonsense that they're pushing today, that you need to do your part and tithe what already belongs to God. This thing is far reaching. It touches every area of our lives. If you want to come out of financial darkness, then you need to give an honest tithe to God in joy and happiness to do it. Amen. I speak from personal experience. My wife tithed us out of possible dire poverty. Yes, yes. She tithed when I didn't even understand why she did it. Uh -huh. Through her tithing, she brought salvation to her house. Because of her ties, God did what he said he would do. Hallelujah. Salvation came to her house because she took care of God's house and he took care of her house. Yeah. I'm here today because of the reverence my wife gave God in her ties and faith. That's why I'm standing here. You can't fight God. When she started putting tithing into the end of the faith against me, it was over. I didn't have a chance. God slew me like David took down Goliath. It was over. I couldn't fight that. Thank you, Jesus. Now we are a house of tithers. Everything in my house, in my, every, everyone in my house ties to God. We tithe for the first, not to the last. Amen. It's bold to tithe from the first, but we serve a mighty bold God. Amen. Amen. Since tithing, we have known no lack of any kind. When things get difficult, we tithe. When things aren't difficult, we tithe. When things are doubtful, we tithe the doubt out of them. Yes. And so can you. Anybody can tithe. Amen. Now I'm going to talk to you about the Bethlehem connection to tithing. I'm going to open this up to you, and you're going to understand just how serious tithing is. You're going to realize the great city of our Lord, Bethlehem, and how it came to be. Just how important is tithing to God? Did you know that Bethlehem was founded on a tithe? Yes, the very city of our Lord Jesus' birth was founded on a tithe to God. This thing is big. It's far-reaching. It's almost everything. Let's learn all about this directly out of the Word of God now. Genesis 28, 10 through 22. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. 
And he, he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land wherein thou liest to thee, I will give it and to thy seed. Talk about Jacob's ladder here in the Bible. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and, and in the end, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land for I will not leave until I have done which I have spoken unto thereof. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Amen. He said when he laid down he had no idea where he was at. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Amen. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillow and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And we know that Luz means light. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and remnant to put on clothes so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And for all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee, the tenth my tithe. Now, if we go a little further in Genesis, we will see that Jacob, beloved wife Rachel, dies and Jacob takes her to Bethlehem to be buried. So Bethel becomes Bethlehem, which indicates the covenant of Abraham and Jacob. Whenceforth, we have it, Bethel, which means house of God, which is Bethlehem. In Genesis 35, 19 through 20, and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave. This is the first time that Bethlehem is mentioned in the Word of God. Bethlehem means house of God. We see here that the very foundations of the chosen city, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, was founded on a tithe. It was founded on a covenant tithe commitment to God. And when we tithe with God, we have the same covenant that they had. We have the same blessing of Abraham. We bring that blessing forth into our life. And we no longer need a window of heaven because we have the window of heaven in us. We have Jesus. Yes. Tithing is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Tithing puts you in the covenant blessing of God. It is the absolute way out of poverty. It works 100% of the time. It is guaranteed by God to do so. Remember he said beyond your wildest dreams. But in order for it to fully propel you out of poverty, you must apply it 100% of the time. I have to share this principle that creates miracles for me in my life. And it will do the same for you. Tithing is the best kept secret to prosperity. It pulls you straight out of poverty immediately, absolutely, every time. It's holy and it's the prosperity that the devil can't touch. To those who are in a relationship with God, tithing is the acknowledgement that he owns everything. It's the acknowledgement that he is God and he is I am. He has commanded us to return to the tithes and offerings to him. In response, he rebukes the devourer and opens the windows of heaven and pours out overflowing blessings to the tither. Most ministers are afraid to speak on the subject of tithing. Why? Because they neither believe God's word on the subject nor do they to practice the principles of tithing for themselves. 
They think because they are ministers, they don't have to. And they are right. They don't have to be blessed either. They can be poor ministers if they want to. That's okay. Yeah, you know, there's room for everybody. Therefore, they cannot speak about it without personal conviction. So they can't give testimony from their own miraculous experiences. But I can because I am a dedicated tither to the Lord and I am perfect in my tithes. <laughs> miracles never cease to amaze me. I see miracles all the time. And I'm not nothing special about the miracles I see. I see them because I'm a tither. That's why I see the miracles. As a matter of fact, I expect them. I already know what's going to happen when I tithe. I already know what's going to happen when I when I bless someone or, or we send money to Israel or whatever we're doing. I already know. You can't out give God. I already know what's coming. He's going to give me more to give with. Amen? That's exactly what's going to happen. But I will tell you what their consistent arrival in my life is always delightful to experience over and over again. Those miracles just keep coming. God says that on earth, there will always be a season of seed time and harvest. And you can read this yourselves out of Genesis chapter 8. It talks about seed time and harvest. The Apostle Paul taught us about the law of sowing and reaping. Sowing means planting, giving. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Amen. He did say whatever. If you give with faith and confidence that you will receive the blessing as promised by God's word, you will. You will receive that blessing. As a tither, you automatically become the solution to the problem. Rather than the focusing on the problem, you solve the problem. Why? Because you fix your heart on the Lord alone. Because you trust in Him alone. Your needs exist to be met. Not to intimidate you, embarrass you, harass you. You don't have needs for that. They're made to be met. God supplied your needs to be met. The written word of God gives us a guarantee that God is our source. Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply all your needings needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That is a promise. That is a guarantee. When you speak this first couple with your tithing, it is a key verse to the miraculous blessing of the Lord. It's a key verse. You understand? It's one of those keys that, that opens the blessing, that opens the door of blessing, where it pours out on you and showers on you. It consistently blesses my house over and over, and it will bless yours just the same over and over and over when backed by your action in tithing. Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given to you unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet with them, it shall be measured to you again. These are Jesus' words, red letter words. Christ said these words. Notice that the word says, shall men give unto your bosom, men. What God is saying here is that he will make people bring the blessing to you. Amen. And whatever you do, whatever your skills are, whatever your hands touch, he'll make them bring them to you. Whether it be by mail, electronically, or in person, you will always be in a position to receive your Promised blessing from God. Yes. But note, whatever you receive is only multiplied by what you give. So let's be blessed and reap what we sow as the abundance of God's favor shows blessing on us. This is called victory and victory is Jesus. Amen. <laughs> if anyone here doesn't know Jesus or has just fallen away, please repeat these few but powerful words after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I now ask you into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us rise in prayer. Father God in heaven, thank you for our victories. We thank you for our victories. We thank you for the, for the, the love and the anointing and the blessing that you pour on us, Father God. We thank you for our beautiful children, our future, who, who are learning wisely by these blessed and anointed teachers. 
We thank you for everything. We thank you for our healings. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the very earth that you give us. We thank you for all you give us, and we're in great thankfulness in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God.